Strategy games are at their best when they're mechanically deep and aesthetically immersive. In other words, when they have soul. In my opinion, the Total War series has lost a lot of this mythical soul in the past decade. And so, with a new Total War on the horizon, I thought it was time to take a look at the most important features the Total War series offered at various points in its life, but which are now no longer available. I really hope they make the return in the future, but for now, remember to subscribe to the channel and let's look at everything that made Total War so much more than just a game. Number 1. Hot Seat Medieval 2 Total War Kingdoms is just an expansion pack, but a brief moment in time became years and even more than a decade as modders embraced the Kingdoms expansion with a passion. And for this moment in time, before subpar online multiplayer campaigns became standard, Creative Assembly introduced the legendary Hot Seat function. Total War was alright on its own, but the full potential was unlocked when me and my brother figured out how Hot Seat worked. With Hot Seat, we could play different factions on the same computer, essentially a local multiplayer campaign. It worked for every single Kingdoms campaign and every mod made for Kingdoms. And so, this single feature added literal thousands of hours of gameplay time for us. We could even play several factions between the two of us, allowing for even deeper roleplaying. Hot Seat was stolen from us as soon as Empire released for no good reason, however. And if you say it's because you couldn't defend settlements in Hot Seat, then I say, well, yes you could. You just have to tweak the game settings. Or if you say it's because it's unfair because only one human player can manually play the battle between two humans, then whatever, that's a loss I'm more than happy to take, and it goes for both players. So it's not like it's unfair that way. All I'm saying is, CA, bring back Hot Seat right now, or else. Number 2. Unit Recruitment Impacts Population Rome Total War might have had the best population system in any Total War game. Not only did you have an actual, realistic population number that determined the stages of your city's development, but waging war and recruiting armies actually took a toll on your city's population. Want to recruit a unit of 100-something soldiers? Well, expect your population number in that city to drop by that exact number. But what is almost even cooler is that once your unit is recruited, you can also disband them, and depending on where you choose to do so, the exact unit number will be added to said city's population. The implications this has for roleplay is insane, because you can kind of imagine your legionaries settling down in newly conquered areas, or it can be a way to simulate migration within your realm. It's a massively cool feature, but of course, hasn't existed in Total War for almost 20 years, so boo hoo. Number 3. Building every building in every province Total War used to be a game series that in so many more ways than these days, focused on the role-playing elements and on the sandbox experience. Now I don't want to miss any words here. It's absolutely possible to have fun with Total War these days and to enjoy the games for what they are. But I firmly believe they used to be so much better, namely because they featured aspects that catered to the imagination of its players, not to arbitrary gameplay rules. And for every game before Empire, you were given the role of city planner and were able to make each city in your image. That means that you were really only limited by three things. Your population number, your main city building, and the money in your purse. The city level would determine the stages and a variety of buildings you could construct. But other than that, and whether you were bordering the sea, there were no limits to how many buildings any one city could feature. While not a perfect system, meaning I would have liked to see many more geographical and historical modifiers to building modifiers per city, which would make building the same building more or less viable in the different cities, but not just actually saying no to you because you're out of tiles, it was so much more immersive than just having a few boxes you could expand until you couldn't anymore. Number 4 is closely linked with 3, and it's all about building UI. Rome and Medieval 2 become older and older, but because they had actual soul, they hold up in many of the places that matter most. One of these are the building icons, which always made my imagination go wild. I loved not only the detailed images of the buildings themselves, but also their larger image cards, which more than anything envisioned actual ancient city life. With these images in Rome, you could imagine what your city looked like even from the campaign space, somehow creating a strong connection between the micro and the macro, especially because images often match the actual models on the battle map. Medieval 2, although with a tad more modest images, also at least showed you what the building looked like. But sadly, this became even more simplified with Empire and onward, until when Rome 2 completely botched everything by using simple generic symbols. Warhammer continued the trend, and by now, it seems like a long shot to imagine that we'll ever get our good old and immersive buildings icons back. 
It's a massive shame and I have no idea why anyone would ever trade away such an imaginative and beautiful building UI for some generic icons. The only modern Total War game that went back in time in this respect was Attila, and it made such a big difference to me. But that's already 8 years ago by now, if you can believe it. Number 5. Map Exploration Did you know that way back when? You didn't actually have a 100% Eye of Sauron-like view of your provinces? No, the areas that weren't highlighted by either cities or armies actually had to be lit by moving there, which made everything a lot more mysterious and fun. Rebels could spawn in the darkened areas, or enemies could lurk where you couldn't see them. And personally, I really like the visual aspect of having certain areas lit, while others are more dimmed. Number 6 ties heavily into number 5, because now we're talking watchtowers and forts. Tapping into more of the role-playing elements, generals could actually lay down forts on the map, very useful when creating defensive positions and fortifying your realm outside of your static cities and castles. Forts could then be loaded up with units and served as a purely defensive structure. At the same time, watchtowers could be raised to further your view of surrounding areas much more so than forts could, and it is with a combination of these two that you could achieve a complete overview of your kingdom and even parts of your surroundings. Sadly, none of these features have made it into games past Empire, which again is a massive shame and severely diminishes my immersion since this is a simple but meaningful aspect that actually makes it feel like you're changing the map itself as you go. Number 7. Moving armies without generals That is right. Back in the day and as late as Shogun 2, you could split up armies and move them around without needing a general to babysit every army. Instead, they were led by captains. Captains, which if successful in battle, could become fully-fledged generals by way of merit alone. It made each campaign so much more flexible to be able to move smaller armies between cities and generals, have some fortify forts by themselves, or use single-unit armies as scouts in enemy kingdoms. And because of this, there was no need for an army limit either, which again is such an artificial and arbitrary gameplay mechanic that detracts from immersion. It says something when Creative Assembly kind of admitted that it is a fun system in their marketing for Rome Remastered. Every unit can lead an army. Armies are more fluid in Rome, adding more strategy to play. If you're waist deep in enemy territory and a few of your units are in a bad way, just send them home to patch up and retrain new units. Equally, you can bolster your forces with units from another army, or completely split your army if you want to go after two targets at the same time. Number 8. In the same ways as armies were more decentralized in that way, so was city taxation. You could actually determine taxation on a city by city basis, choosing to increase income over city growth in happy, secure, and large cities, or ease on the financial pressure in newly conquered or rebellious towns. Just like with captain led armies, it really just makes sense and adds to the granular feeling of older Total Wars compared to the modern day centralized and simplified style. Number 9, and sticking to the more organic philosophy of development, Total War used to have no overarching technology tree, but was in fact based on each individual building. In this day and age, tech trees have become commonplace in games, but it's honestly a massive crush for innovation. And back in the day, where there were no tech trees, your units got better because you actually expanded your cities and upgraded your buildings. It really is that simple, and that organic, not determined by some artificial tree. I will say though that a combination of the two systems could very much be possible, and I still think research systems haven't been fully realized in any Total War to date. But if I had to choose, I much preferred the organic way of doing things that Total War offered in the past. Number 10. Trade Lanes What I thought was so much fun in games like Medieval 2 and Empire was creating trading ports and seeing my hard work pay off. Trading ships and lanes were some of the most important symbols of a fledging financial empire in Total War. But in the latest games, trade lanes seem to have become less and less important, with not nearly every trading port having a lane going abroad or even between its own ports. In Rome and Medieval 2, you could even see which cities each city traded with, which is such an amazingly immersive feature, whether it was over ground or on the water. Number 11. Did you know that you could upgrade units on the campaign app with better armor, and then see that change represented on the battlefield? Medieval 2 is the only game that did this, and it was spectacularly awesome. It meant that you didn't necessarily need to recruit all new units for the battlefield to become that much more diverse, and for us to see some fresh new threats. In this way, a really cool gameplay mechanic on the campaign was made immersive by mimicking the feature on the 3D models. But today, I'm fairly certain only a miracle can bring this feature back. Number 12 is a small thing in the grand scheme of things, but massive in my heart. 
In games like Rome and Medieval 2, if you double clicked on a general unit, you were actually taken directly to the general's unit in the bodyguard. And because generals were so important, this made the entire difference. Because by doing so, you could always know where your general was and try to keep him safe. These days, doing the same basically just takes you back to your unit in general, no pun intended, making it much harder to make out where the important guy really is. Number 13 is all about immersion, namely that Rome allowed us to actually view our cities on the battle map in peacetime. This meant that you could get a real up and cozy view of your towns and cities at all times. It's such a nice and simple mechanic that again, I have no idea why they removed and never put back in. What's funny is that Feral Interactive actually put it into their Medieval 2 version for iPhone and iPad, and Android I guess, and it's awesome that they did. I don't even dare hope for this feature to return, but I know it made a massive difference because of how unique and charming it was. Number 14, and we're talking about the features that just make sense. Before, you actually had to build ships to get your armies anywhere across the ocean. Like honestly, it makes no sense and no fun that armies can just automatically turn into an army of ships on a whim. I don't care if they lose movement points or become seasick or whatever. It's dumb and unimmersive, and it completely strips away the awesome importance of being a dominating naval power, or the actual investment of building a navy to take your army across the sea. Number 15 is another feature that just makes sense, namely the fact that if you lose your ability to lay siege to a city, you automatically lose the battle. Total War has become better in the past few years when it comes to actually needing siege engines to assault a walled city again, but once on the battlefield, your units can often automatically spawn ladders out of their asses or toss fire at city gates to burn them up. It's stupid and a gamification of a system that actually used to make sense. It was awesome that a besieging army actually needed to be able to lay siege, and if they didn't, they just lost and had to retreat. Number 16, and we're back with Empire. The one feature that stood out in Empire for me was the fact that depending on your population growth, it was actually possible for villages to pop up over time and become important centers of resource. It was really cool to see the map change over time like this, and really made both a gameplay and visual change from early to late game. I think this is as close to a perfect province system as Total War has come, although the rest of the building system and number of cities of course left a lot to be desired. And finally, number 17 is the complete and total removal of the all-important naval battles. Like seriously, naval battles were a revolutionary innovation in Empire Total War, and even though it never really became as good as it was with sailing ships and gunpowder, even though it definitely was fun in Shogun 2 Follow the Samurai as well, naval battles remained a staple even in Rome 2, Attila, and Thrones of Britannia, even allowing for amphibious assaults and sieges that looked so cinematic. And somehow, in a game like Warhammer 3, where some of the races are meant to have awesome naval forces, or in Troy where the naval warfare was a big part of stuff, there's absolutely no naval action on the battle map to be seen. Naval battles add a whole nother dimension to Total War, and to lose an entire field of battle like this, which could have been its own game frankly, is a complete and total shame. In other words, this absolutely exhaustive list of features and their losses have made sure that Total War has yet to see its glory restored. It's why so many people long back to the days of Rome and Medieval 2, and why even today, Empire and Napoleon have their own loyal following, with players and modders who wanted so much more for their game. And what sucks equally bad is the fact that when Creative Assembly actually innovate again with Attila, they completely failed with the game code, leaving a badly optimized game with completely broken shadows, and never cared enough to fix or update their game. All of these features mentioned are what gave the earlier Total War games their soul, and made them into games that people dedicated their lives to by expanding them and making them even better. If someone from CA watches this, I hope you realize that all us players want to do is love your current games and future ones as much as we love your former titles. But there has to be a two-way street here. We demand the depth and soul of old, with features that make sense and are immersive, and that are not just made to make a buck or to simplify former aspects that actually added to the fun. And I'm certain that once the features of old return, hopefully in even better packages and forms, that the fans are all too happy to love Total War as much as they ever did. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know your thoughts on these features and your own thoughts on the games in the comments. Leave a like, sub to the channel, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.